And Michelle, if you can admit people as we get started, that would be wonderful. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started um, so that we can get through all the great things that we want to cover today. So um, welcome everyone. My name is Corey Johnson and I'm a program support manager here at Safe Routes Partnership. And this is the um, second webinar this year for our Colorado Safe Routes to School webinar series. And today we are talking all about culturally responsive Safe Routes to School programming. Um, that's kind of like a part two to what we talked about in our first webinar session, which, um, which was about Colorado's new community engagement guide that we, uh, we put together in partnership with um, Colorado Safe Routes to School. So for those of you who are uh, joining us and we're on the first webinar, welcome back. And for those of you who are jumping on uh, brand new for this session, we're happy to have you. So just for those of you who might be um, new to Safe Routes Partnership, um, our mission is to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools in everyday life, improving the health and well-being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, we will be moving into breakout groups a bit later, so those breakout groups won't be recorded, but the opening presentation will be recorded and posted on our website uh, later this afternoon. Um, along with the presentation slides and some follow-up materials. So um, don't worry about feverishly taking notes because we have a recording that'll be ready for you to go. We also have the chat box open. Uh, let me just make sure that it's open to everybody, it should be. So please feel free to participate in the chat. Um, we hope that we can have a nice lively discussion, especially since we're talking about community engagement. Um, so please feel free to use the chat to um, ask questions, share ideas. And actually I'll give you your first opportunity to use the chat right now. Um, let's see. So um, as I mentioned, I'm Corey um, with Safe Routes Partnership. I'm based in Washington, DC. I also have my colleague, uh, Michelle Lieberman, who's on just to provide some backup tech support, which is always helpful. Um, she's in Orange County, California. And we'd love to see, just see who is on our session today. So if in the chat box, you could please um, introduce yourself, just put down your name, uh, where you're joining us from, um, your connection to Safe Routes to School. And also, um, because this will be relevant to our conversation today, what is something that you wish people knew about the place where you live? Um, so consider, you know, misconceptions, stereotypes, or even like hidden gems that somebody might not be aware of if they're not from your community. So to give you an example, um, I live in DC and you know, obviously people think about DC and they think about politics and that's kind of like everything. Politics takes over all of the city, um, even though that's, you know, it's the big part of the city, but not everything. So I always tell people that DC has a really thriving arts community even like outside of the Smithsonian museums. There's a lot of um, you know, public art, um, street art, community art. So that's one thing that I wish people knew more about when they think about um, DC. So if you could please introduce yourself in the chat and uh, do the same thing. So who you are, your connection to safe routes to school, and then something that you wish people knew um, about the community where you live. So I'll give people a moment to kick us off. I see Devin, thank you. Jenna from Montana. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, I think it's pretty crowded in Fort Collins these days from Lisa. Great, great, great. So we have more Colorado, Arizona. Uh, somebody else from Colorado who, has a, who lives in a best kept secret. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, 
let's see, Minnesota, making great progress on safe routes and active transportation plans. That's great. Um, awesome. So feel free to continue um, adding to the conversation in the chat. We love just getting to learn a bit more about who you all are and where you're coming from and what makes your communities great. Um, so we will keep that chat going and I will move us along. Oh, I see somebody else from DC is here. That's exciting. Hello, neighbor. Um, yeah, so we'll keep moving. All right, so a quick review of our agenda for today. Um, so I will do a quick recap of the Colorado Community Engagement Guide that we talked about last time. I'll talk a bit about what responsive, culturally responsive and community responsive programming is, uh, followed by an example of how I've used this uh, approach in my own work. Then we'll do a little breakout activity um, that we hope you all will join us for. And then a um, uh, final group discussion, Q&A, and then some reminders and next steps. So just to kick us off um, and review a little bit about why we're here um, in this guide that we created, um, I worked with Colorado Safe Routes to School and Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to put together this community engagement guide. Um, that really lays out a community engagement framework for people to follow, um, whether you're from an organization or a government agency or if, you're, if you're, or if you're an individual. It lays out a community engagement framework along with highlighting best practices. Um, it has guiding questions for each section and really features a lot of um, great things that are happening in Colorado with Colorado programs and um, and, and agencies um, around Colorado. We also include links to tools, worksheets, and additional resources, and there's a large emphasis on, uh, on equity. Um, that's a big part of the work that's happening in Colorado, and so we wanted to wrap that into, um, into this guide. And just to lay out the community engagement framework, um, it's broken down into uh, six parts. The first one, reflecting on your role as a community partner. So why are you here? Why do you do this work? Um, researching the community where you're working, partnering with other organizations to build community relationships, planning thoughtful, culturally responsive community engagement experiences, which we'll talk a bit about today, um, implementing your community engagement experiences, experiences and events, and then lastly, sustaining your engagement beyond a single event or initiative. And so I have um, two of these um, parts of the framework highlighted in, uh, in purple, reflecting on your role as a community partner and then research in the community where you're working, because that's where a lot of the conversations today will, uh, will focus on those two areas, research, uh, reflection and research. So I wanted to start off by talking a bit about what culturally responsive um, and community responsive programming actually uh, looks like. What does that mean? Um, and so this is actually an approach that's used a lot in an um, education field. I used to be a teacher and that's actually where I first heard of this term. Um, and it's a you know, research-based um, teaching method that uh, a lot of educators are, um, are using or thinking about using in their classrooms. So culturally responsive approach is really about um, valuing community assets over community, de community deficiencies and connecting different cultures, languages, and life experiences with, uh, with learning and programming. And, um, you know, especially with a lot of communities, um, you know, becoming more, uh, more diverse. Um, this approach really ups, uplifts those perspectives and narratives might be outside of the traditional white, uh, Western or US, you know, uh, American English speaking uh, norms to bring in some other perspectives um, from different backgrounds. Um, culture responsive, uh, learning and, and teaching and programming also allows people to see their life and culture reflected in meaningful ways. Um, so to be able to see somebody who looks like you, um, you know, riding a bike or, or taking a walk or riding on a scooter um, or sharing those stories about what, um, you know, walking and biking means to you, all of those are part of a culturally responsive approach. Um, it also builds understanding and awareness of different cultures. So, you know, being able to share those stories can also help um, other people understand a bit more about a culture that they might not know a lot about um, from their own lives. So there is that um, cultural exchange that's happening. And it can also help shift power to community members who are usually left out of decision-making processes. Um, you know, so, um, you know, for example, um, there might be some communities where everybody who makes the decisions are white, 
uh, and have money and are homeowners, just as an example. Um, a culturally responsive approach might look to um, incorporate more people into the decision-making process um, who might be non-white or who might um, you know, be tenants or who might have lower incomes. So it really expands that, um, that decision-making power um, and, and distributes it a bit more equitably. So culturally responsive programming um, can look like so many different things. It can look like having multi, having materials translated into multiple languages. Um, this, this photo on the right is an example from um, Safe Routes to School Philadelphia, which has some amazing educational resources that are translated into, I don't know, I want to say at least five languages, definitely English. Uh, I think they have Chinese, Spanish, Russian, maybe Arabic. Um, so that's an example. Um, including images of non-white people walking and rolling in program materials. I know that when I started my work here in DC, one of the first things that I did, knowing that I'd be working in a predominantly black community, was to find images of black people walking and biking and uh, being out, uh, you know, living, living our lives. So that could be a part of this. Um, framing walking and biking as a family activity as opposed as, to, as opposed to a way to be physically active. Um, so there are some communities where, you know, like that that family unit, it's 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 the core of of everything. And so to frame, um, you know, even a walking school bus program or a bike rodeo as something that a family can participate in um, could help encourage some families who might be, you know, kind of on the fence or feel like um, this activity or program isn't for them. Doing off-campus outreach, um, so a lot of you might be working with specific school campus, with specific school communities, um, and just thinking about, you know, there might be some people who don't have access to the school campus or just aren't there for many different reasons. So where else can you go to engage people? Can you go to a local restaurant, a grocery store, a laundry mat? Can you do a bike helmet giveaway at a health clinic or a bus stop or a park um, or a library? I've done a lot of events at libraries. So really going to where your, uh, where your target audience is. Um, also incorporating other forms of movement into your activities. So can you incorporate a little dance party um, into an event that you're doing? Or I know that um, Safe Routes to School, Charlotte, North Carolina, they, uh, for their walk to school day event, they actually paired it with a uh, pickup soccer game in the morning. So everybody like walked over to the field, saw a little quick soccer game, um, and then went and did, you know, completed a walk to school day because they had a lot of um, Latino families in the area who played soccer and loved soccer. And so they incorporated that into their walk to school day event. And then finally, um, having community and student design walking and biking maps. And I'll share an example what that looks like a little bit later. So these are just a few examples of what um, programming can look like. Um, the important thing to remember is that this is a step-by-step -step program. It's really a practice. So it's about trying new things, challenging yourself, um, getting a bit uncomfortable at times, knowing that you don't have all the answers and that's okay. Um, there will probably be moments where you'll be humbled or make mistakes, but that's how we grow and we can all, we can all do this. And lastly, culturally responsive and community responsive program really depends on the community where you're working and the people who you are working with. So in order to do this well, you have to build your own understanding of the community so that you can actually be responsive to what the community wants and needs. And uh, we do that by reflecting um, on our roles as community partners and also researching the community uh, where we're working. And so I touched on this in our last um, webinar, um, just starting out by thinking about uh, reflecting on your role as a community partner, just to, you know, ground your work and give yourself some purpose, um, to acknowledge your power and privilege that you might have um, in relation to the community that you're engaging. And this is just a really important step in grounding your work and also in building trust. Um, and it's also really important if you're working in a community that you're not, you know, like living in or from, um, or if you're a white person who's working in a predominantly community, a, 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 a community of color. Um, thinking about some of those power and privilege, privilege dynamics that could be playing out um, in some of those interactions you might be having. A reflection can look like just, a, you know, even a conversation with yourself, a conversation with others, being open and honest and being uncomfortable at sometimes too, being uncomfortable at times too. Um, and then just thinking about like some self-reflection questions, um, just asking yourself, you know, like, what do you already know about this community? Um, again, how does your own power and privilege impact the community? What stereotypes might you hold? Um, and what biases might you have that might impact your ability to, um, you know, engage this community? 
So I'm going to give you an example, actually, from my own work about what this looks like. So um, I mentioned that I live in D.C., and when I first started the partnership, I worked on a community engagement project um, in southeast D.C. So this is a little picture of D.C. It almost looks like a diamond, and the circle that's highlighted in orange is southeast D.C., um, and D.C. split up into wards. So this area is either called southeast, um, east of the river, because the, this area is geographically separated by um, a river and also a highway. Um, or Ward 7 and 8. Um, it's also a community or an area that has so much um, natural beauty and, uh, and historic charm. Um, it's also deeply under-resourced due to systemic disinvestment, and it's a predominantly um, Black community. So I, when I first started, um, you know, working in, you know, taking on this role in this position, I asked myself, okay, what do I already know about you know, this community here in here in Southeast DC. Um, I knew that I wanted to get people involved in Safe Routes to School and in Vision Zero, and that I'd be working with community members in this particular area of the city. And so I asked myself, okay, what do I already know about, safe, about Southeast DC? The first thing that I thought of was when I was younger, um, I grew up in suburban Maryland, and we would come to DC all the time to go to museums or just hang out as a family. And I remember my parents telling me that that part of the city was dangerous. For the longest time, when I was little, just driving into the city, that's, that was my first thought of Southeast DC. It's dangerous. We don't go to that part of the city. We never came to Southeast DC on our family trips. Um, that's just what I, what I was told. Um, beyond that, I didn't really know much else about this particular area. Um, you know, obviously, like once I you know, got older and took on this position. And by that point, I had worked in a bunch of other cities that had and communities that have been considered dangerous as well. Uh, my, you know, worldview had changed a whole lot. And I knew that this wasn't, you know, the case. Um, but it was important for me to really think about like those initial um, perceptions that I had of the area as a kid and um, how those might impact my ability to, um, you know, work with community members meaning meaningfully and build relationships um, in the work I was doing as, as, as an adult. So it's both a moment of, you know, honesty, doesn't feel great that I, you know, that was my first perception, but I think that part of, um, you know, reflecting and doing this work is really being honest with ourselves um, and having these difficult moments and conversations. So I wanted to share what mine was um, when I first started working uh, in Southeast DC. So after I kind of realized that I really didn't know much about this area, I thought, okay, I need to do some community research so I can figure out where I'm working and who I'm working with. Um, community research is really important because it helps you build your own understanding of a community. It helps build your cultural competency, um, helps you build trust with community members, and really shows a willingness to learn about other perspectives. Community research is also really helpful in, in um, for informing your future programming. So knowing more about the community will help you be able to, um, you know, incorporate some of those learnings into your events and activities moving forward. And it can also help dispel some negative, nar negative nar narratives about communities of color, low-income communities, and rural communities, just any community that, um, you know, traditionally has uh, a negative stereotype attached to it. So community research can look like so many different things from riding around a community, just, get, just getting on transit, doing interviews, doing different community events, going on a tour, talking with people, um, even just using Google Maps. I know that I work with communities across the country, so I'm on Google Maps all the time trying to figure out <laughs> what these different places look like. Um, so, uh, you know, community research is really what you make it out to be. Just to show you how I did this um, in Southeast DC. Again, this was you know kind of like my childhood perception of Southeast DC that it's a dangerous area. Um, and so, my first I don't know at least few weeks here at the partnership, um, I just went and spent a whole lot of time walking and riding around um, Southeast DC. So, just walking around downtown, I went to a community museum that talked a bit about the history of the neighborhood the history of the neighborhoods and learning that actually this area of the city used to be predominantly white. Um, and then once black people started moving into the area, the white people left and now it's predominantly black. So that shift was really interesting to learn about. 
I went to um, different art museums. Uh, I went and rode around, walked around a few different parks. I didn't know that there was that much green space in the area. I went to um, walk around different heritage trails. I went to a local bookstore just to see, you know, what's happening in the bookstore. I went and helped out a local farmer's market just to kind of see what other community partners were out there. Um, helped out at a few bike repair clinics in the area. I even just like went to local restaurants trying to find like what's the best, what's the best pizza spot, what's the best coffee shop. Um, so all of these things played into my, um, you know, building up my understanding of this community and kind of creating a more full portrait of what this place is besides it's dangerous. And obviously you can see that all of these photos here um, paint a very different picture than, you know, a, a danger zone. So um, a few more things that I learned through my research is that um, so much green space is in this uh, part of the city. Also lots of hills, it's very hilly. Um, bus access is essential. There's a lot of um, Southeast DC pride, which I really love. Um, a lot of vegan vegetarian food, which is great for me since I'm vegetarian. Um, one big one that I actually thought was interesting was that people told me as I was walking around and chatting with people that they hated surveys, they were done with surveys, no more surveys. So I knew that in my work that I should probably not be surveying people a whole lot unless I absolutely had to, because that's not what community members wanted. Um, there's also a lot of art that was everywhere. Um, and there's also a really strong transportation advocacy community in this part of the city. So I took all of that learning and again, shifting from my old perception of this area, started incorporating that learning into my programming. So going on more community walks with people, um, you know, putting together, uh, you know, bike rodeos for students um, and also knowing that this, you know, people are having trouble riding their bikes on hills. So do we need electric bikes or um, specific instruction on bike riding in a hilly area? Um, partnering with um, local neighborhood commissioners to lead pop-up demonstrations. Um, organizing walk to school day. And this guy who's right here in the middle, um, he was actually a community partner who I went on a long walk with one day um, because somebody had been killed um, not too far away from, uh, from his apartment building in a traffic um, in a traffic collision. And he's been advocating for transportation, better transportation in this neighborhood specifically for a long time. And so we went and walked around for, I don't know, maybe like at least an hour, two hours. Um, just talking about, you know, how to improve things. And he's now like one of the, uh, you know, big transportation advocates here in DC. Um, and then incorporating art into a lot of the work that I do. Um, and I'll show an example of what that looks like a bit later too. Just because I saw that, you know, um, this is an arts rich community. People love to create things and sing and dance and have music. And so I wanted to incorporate that into, um, you know, safety demonstrations and other events that we had going on. Um, so that's a bit about how I incorporated some of my learnings into um, the programs that I was working on. Um, and then again, just like another photo of me with some of my wonderful community partners um, and people who really, uh, yeah, helped make um, my work both, you know, meaningful and impactful and also relevant to, um, you know, the community that I was, that I was working in. Um, so quickly, just as I mentioned, um, a few ways that my community research has helped inform um, some safe routes to school programs specifically. So I already talked about the electric bike situation um, and kind of trying to navigate a more hilly terrain. Um, with starting walking school bus program, um, you know, like there are some parents and community members who are really concerned about, um, about safety, you know, and like, while I, you know, don't want to say that the whole community is dangerous, like I thought it was originally, um, you know, there is an issue with gun violence, and it's something that, um, that, you know, that should be addressed, and that is a concern, and so that was something that had to be incorporated into um, any sort of walking school bus um, initiatives that we wanted to start. Um, again, with the student, student travel tallies and parent surveys, um, needing to find non-traditional ways to survey people. So dot surveys, interviews, comment boards, um, bike helmet fittings, knowing that uh, you know, like there are a lot of girls, even like the two little kids you see here in this photo, um, making sure that helmets can fit different hairstyles, hair coverings. That was something that I wanted to keep in mind um, on, on bike, bike helmet giveaway day or uh, bike rodeo days. Um, also, exploring, exploring engagement options that do not include law enforcement. Um, this is both in response to concerns over over policing and police brutality. Um, 
Um, again, being in a predominantly black neighborhood, this was a huge concern for people. Um, I imagine that in communities um, with large immigrant populations, this can, not, this can also be a concern, especially around, um, you know, um, citizenship status. So even if um, law enforcement is involved as a volunteer um, in an engagement activity, um, just thinking about how their presence might impact community members is something to um, to consider. So like while you might not have ill intentions for involving someone, um, it could be a barrier to participation for certain community members. And then lastly, um, just using art, music, and dance and educational activities. And I want to show an example of what this looks like from one of my wonderful um, community partners. Um, she, her name is Sweets. I met her in some of my um, in my community research phase. She's a professional clown um, who's also a crossing guard and cares deeply about safety and tries to make safety um, fun and educational while using uh, music and dance to, uh, to inspire and educate the community. I'm gonna show you a quick video um, from her. It'll give you a sense of what this looks like. Always remember, before you cross the street, three, simple, easy, easy, smart techniques. Okay, okay, okay. Before I cross the street, I gotta look both ways. In fact, I never step my two feet off the curb unless a traffic signal say okay. Then I swerve. But when school let out and it's dismissal, I only cross the street after I check the signal. The crossing guard waved her hand, heard her blow the whistle. Now I'm on alert, safety cross the street because it's official. But wait, I gotta hurry up before the countdown. Sorry about that, we'll start again. Okay. Okay, before I cross the street, I gotta look both ways. In fact, I never step my two feet off the curb unless the traffic signal say okay. Then I swerve. But when school let out and it's dismissal, I only cross the street after I check the signal. The crossing guard waved her hand, heard her blow the whistle. Now I'm on alert, safety cross the street because it's official. But wait, I gotta hurry up before the countdown. It's like the time to play like a city clown. The message safely crossed the street. Repeat these three simple techniques. You look left, right, left. What else? Left, right, left. Look left, right, left. Look left, right, left. Left, right, left. Look left, right, left. Come on. So that's an example um, of a great community partner who used, um, you know, music and music that's relevant to the community, dance that's relevant to the community to create a really cool um, educational resource about crossing the street. And Sweets is from, um, she is from Southeast DC, works deeply in, you know, in Southeast DC. This is, you know, her community. And um, this is an example of what culturally responsive and community responsive programming can look like. Um, you know, it's music that kids listen to, it's dancing that kids listen to. It was filmed, um, you know, in the neighborhoods where, you know, kids are, kids are walking and biking. Um, and it's just, uh, yeah, great, joyful way to, uh, to inspire people to, uh, to walk and bike safely. Um, and again, this is something that's very specific to, you know, this community. Um, and the goal of me showing this to you is just to say that um, you know, culture responsive programming. It's really about, um, you know, what that, that specific community that you're working in, what they want and, uh, and what they need. Um, and just a few other uh, final takeaways before we kind of jump into our next phase of this. Um, just a few more lessons that I learned through this process is that a little walk or a ride can go a long way. So just taking a walk around a neighborhood can do, um, it's, it's so, uh, powerful and impactful. It can do so much um, both in uh, pushing your own learning forward and then also, again, trying to kind of um, dispel some of those conceptions that you might have about a community. 
Um, using a lot of images and videos as opposed to, you know, text heavy things, um, that's super helpful. Um, also choosing community research activities that fit with your schedule and lifestyle. Um, I had a lot of time to go out and explore different neighborhoods. Um, you know, I don't have kids to take care of in the evenings or a weekend. So I was really able to like go out there and spend a lot of time. If time is limited for you or capacity is limited for you, think about what activities you can do. Can you take five minutes to um, you know, explore somewhere on Google Maps, or can you go and, you know, have, uh, you know, go out for dinner in a different neighborhood than you usually go. So I think about what makes sense in, in the context of your schedule and your life. Um, also, understanding that a program might not be a priority for somebody, and that's okay. So everybody might not be into safe routes to school. Um, it might not be a priority for them. Maybe their priority is securing housing or food or healthcare. So be prepared for somebody to not want to accept what you're offering and think about if you can offer something else that person might want or need. Um, and going along with that, it's really important to find partners who are doing parallel work. So um, in Southeast DC, food access is a big issue. There are only a handful of grocery stores that serve a really large community. Um, and so I partnered a lot with um, farmers markets and different food access organizations. Um, so I would distribute materials there, do activities during a farmers market or a food distribution event. Um, so I could both, um, you know, support a essential need for the community, which is the need for food, but, um, you know, also give out some extra information on, you know, safe walking and biking. And then lastly, and I'll send all of these links out after the session, um, just a few other um, culturally responsive Safe Routes School program highlights from our partners across the country. Um, I know Safe Routes School Portland um, has partnered with um, food distribution sites to hand out materials. And I think there are a lot of groups that have done that during the pandemic. Safe Routes to School Monterey County in California has paired Safe Routes to School um, into a, um, along with the civic engagement program. Um, that they have for uh, for immigrants, which has been really helpful, just introducing Safe Routes School to the community. Um, in Fresno and San Diego, Safe Routes School groups have been started by um, mom walking groups, just like moms who are kind of concerned about safety in their neighborhood, and so they started their own Safe Routes School programs, really grew organically from the community. Um, Santa Ana Safe um, Active Streets, also in California, organized Thursday night bike rides, redistributed bike lights, and also partnered with housing services and a food pantry and COVID outreach teams. Um, I already mentioned Safe Routes to School Charlotte. And then lastly, um, Portland Metro put together this really great community designed um, walking and biking maps specifically for um, Latino communities um, that's very uh, vibrant and image based and it was designed by community members. So like I said, I will send out links to um, those materials and I will pause for a moment to see if there are any questions before we jump into um, our next session. Um, there's one question about the Safe Passage program. So here in DC, we have um, a Safe Passage program, which um, I wanna say it's run by the police department, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, or if, if it's still run by the police department, but it's basically, it's more about, so while Safe Routes School is more based on um, you know, like traffic safety, the Safe Passage program is really around um, personal safety, interrupting violence um, on your way to you know, school or everyday destinations. And so we kind of tried to pair that personal safety piece um, with the traffic safety piece and making sure that people felt um, safe in all ways as they were traveling around their community. And I can send more information about the Safe Passage program as well. Um, all right, so with that, I'm going to 